really honored to have these four guys on the stage. So if you look at the Helsinki scene, there's a lot been happening here in the past uh, three or four years. But in the end, it's all about the success of individual companies. And these four represent some of the biggest success stories to come out of here in the past five, ten years. Uh, but to kick it off, actually, all of these companies, funnily enough, were started by students of this university. So Helsinki University of Technology or the current Aalto University of Technology. Uh, and to kick it off, I'd love to get the stories of each of these uh, companies, companies on stage and each of these people. So Monty, you were the, uh, if you look at MySQL, that was the com first company founded uh, from the list of companies there. So could you briefly tell about the story of MySQL, how it came to be? Okay, so it's actually a 33 long story. It was started the same year that I started at the Open Ocean, uh, sorry, I mean, in Otaniemi, and uh, as a project I, uh, from one of my friends in Sweden, I got to, to uh, write the database application for to solve a problem, and they gave me a database tool. The database tool was horrible. I mean, I, I, I told him that uh, I can write a database and do the project faster than <coughs> the tool. And they challenged me, and uh, after one week, I uh, the, um, created a prototype that they started to use for customers. And then I was suddenly in the database business, and that continued as a consultant. We were a three company, a three person company for 10 years. Uh, 95, the product was uh, good enough, and uh, then we thought that now we have something that we can give back to the open source community because we have used open source tools during the whole project. And now we also come up with a way how to make money on it. So we released this at uh, in 95, as so open source, and the story then continues that uh, it got to, to be one of the most downloaded softwares on the net uh, up to five years ago. This was before the apps on the phones, and it was sold to Sun for one billion. And I thought that, okay, no, I done my part. I, I uh, went with Sun uh, to, to ensure the product should survive. Uh, left there after one year. Uh, basically the same time as Oracle about Sun and uh, because Oracle didn't give a single uh, securement that they actually would continue to develop MySQL for the future. Uh, we bought the product together with original engineers called it MariaDB and now we are working on that and uh, from the success part, for that part, in, in most of the open source uh, distributions of software today, uh, Marini had replaced MySQL in almost everyone, except in two. So, uh, we are doing it again. Mm -hmm. oh, and if I remember correctly... Should I, re should I repeat that? <laughs> <laughs> and if I remember correctly, you named MySQL after your first daughter, Mu, and Mary database after your second one. Yes, and I had also, I have also son Max, and we also had a Max DB in between. <laughs> and we also had the MySQL Max version. We maybe even do want to do a uh, MariaDB Max version with all features turned on just to make it him happy. So think about that when you use Facebook next time. <laughs> uh, okay, the second entrepreneur in order would be then Ilka from Stonesoft. You guys started Stonesoft in the late 90s, if I remember correctly. Or you were also a student at uh, the University of Dutton. <coughs> I founded the company in 1990. And uh, in the beginning, we started to make. Uh, very complex uh, consultation for Finnish big, uh, for big Finnish companies, but, but uh, very soon we started to work on also the network security business area. And uh, we built on for Checkpoint Firewall 1 on this kind of high availability add on feature 96, and, and, uh, and that started to sell like a crazy. And the reason was very easy because the production at that time were very immature and they crashed. And if you had on your internet connection and your firewall crash, you do not have an internet connection. But with our add-on software, you could have on this kind of high availability solution. We met the uh, public as 1990, and uh, we made a secondary offering on 2000. And on that, we were pretty lucky. We raised quite a lot of money on that time. On, on that. And, uh, and uh, one of the, uh, the board members said that you need to be a little bit hurried on collecting this money and uh, we made the second offering and market crashed after the second week or two weeks after our <laughs> offering. So we were pretty lucky on that. Uh, okay, we came on, on the 
our own firewall production on the 2001 and uh, at the same time the whole market for us as you know this kind of uh, bubble uh, what was and uh, and uh, we had on two different CEOs and, and the table thinking was we have some problems and, and, uh, and they tried to figure out what to do and, and, uh, and uh, this didn't go very well it was really really and uh, 2004, the chairman of the board came to me and said that, that Ilka, we have seen two times on, on this kind of general management in this case. Now we need to have a CEO who understands the business and why the uh, customers and needs of this product. I said, how long time it takes? Okay, maybe three years. Okay, well, I'm fine. I, I can do it. And uh, then I made also a decision that I don't take any salary before. To make a problem. It took on eight years back then. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and it was very well known secret in, in the Finnish uh, newspapers. And, and when the uh, Intel McAfee came and bought our company, there was on this kind of Ilkas payday and this kind of uh, announcements. But, but in reality, it wasn't in, in reality the walk in the park from 2004, 2009, 2010. It was really difficult times. And, and uh, I remember there was on the biggest business magazine, there was on the last kind of whole page story about the Stones of Last Nails, Last Nail in Stones of Copper. And uh, I was thinking, well, this, it seems to be that we have a bad times now. Uh, it wasn't very nice to when we have a quarterly uh, report announcing that it's uh, uh, to go out as a CEO and tell that yes, we didn't sell so well and we lost money. But world changed. Network security as a whole came as, as something that you need to have a professional product. And uh, we had a very important thing in our company, we built just product. We, we tried to make the best product in the world. And 2010, our R&D guys found a way that they can pass by all the other products in the world. In the, and, uh, and we came out and, and announced. And uh, currently the situation is the same, that the only product who can protect against these kind of attacks is, is the storm storm firewall lines. And uh, that's when you are in the military or, or internal ministries or critical networks or whatever. You don't like to have a product which we can easily solve that okay, we can pass by. And, uh, and we got the reputation that our product is great and we lost uh, one multiple of tests and, and uh, so that is basically a story, story yeah. of how you, how you use the immense talent here. I mean, all these stories actually share the fact that uh, there's immense technical talent in this region. I mean, you guys just came from Sweden where companies like Spotify and Klarna and Trade Double and a lot of others have been built. built. I mean, you can hear it from both of these stories then. But let's move on to Ilkko's next roster. So you guys started your first company. I guess we should like briefly go through the story of your first company, Sumea, which you started in, was it 2001? Uh, 2000, exactly. 2000, right after the bubble. Like the bubble. Right, actually, like right, I think before the bubble. So, um, so it, it was just a like, coincidence. I was studying here also at the Helsinki University of Technology and uh, had taken a couple of classes on a like, new venture development at the, at the time. And uh, like, just through a, a, a friend, I met a few guys who wanted to set up their own games company. And, uh, and all the other guys in that group, they just wanted to like focus on you know developing games. So. They were either artists or, or programmers, and uh, I was a pretty poor, poor programmer. I wanted to be one, but I was uh, just uh, wasn't smart enough to do that. So, uh, so I was the only guy, only guy who was even remotely interested in anything else than game development. And of course, I had been studying um, uh, industrial management at, at the university here. Of course, I had zero experience on that stuff, but uh, but I had a, a, a bit, bit passion for it. So I. And so nobody else wanted to do the, do that job, so it, it was then mine, and I, I became the CEO of that company. And uh, of course, with like zero experience, and and, uh, and they had a couple of real rough years. It, it was impossible to raise raise financing, but uh, but uh, we, we 
finally we got a couple of uh, customers, got some cash flow, cash flow coming in, and, and using that we invested all that cash flow uh, into developing games or products of our own, and then we kind of got lucky with the timing that because the dot com bubble had burst, that took all of our competition, basically wiped out of the, the whole whole Europe, and, and like surprisingly enough, we were able to uh, strike deals with every single major of like. European uh, telecom operator at the time. So uh, uh, we, uh, within a few years, I think we had uh, like a, basically all the carriers covered. We even managed to get I think AT and T from the US and, and one other. And, uh, and yeah, and then you know, I just just a small que uh, short question there. So how many countries have, did you actually have to tra uh, travel to to be close deals with those operators? Uh, I don't know. I probably stopped counting after like 30. 35 countries or so, that uh, was but the, yeah, that was before the App Store. Yeah, so the, oper the market was extremely fragmented. So I think in every single country you had like three to four operators, and you had to do a deal with each each one of those. Uh, uh, so yeah, so we were basically do, using like cheap student tickets and flying all over and, and trying to um, get those deals done. And then I think it was the sum, uh, the Christmas of 2002. If, I, if I'm not mistaken, but I think the first kind of color screen Java enabled phones came out uh, from companies like Nokia, and uh, all of a sudden those were in the hands of the consumers, and there were one of the few, very few companies who actually had that like, pretty good distribution network, and, and all of a sudden the, the money started to come in. So a typical price for a mobile game at the time was I think five euros, give or take, and uh, it was roughly 50 percent of that to us, and. and uh, and all of a sudden, we, we noticed that hey, we actually do, we can actually pay salaries, and we have this like cash flow positive company, and they start to grow. What we bought was quite quickly, so we grew it to like 40 people. And then in 2004, we decided to sell it to a, a Silicon Valley based company called Digital Chocolate, and uh, uh, and then I actually stayed almost for six years working for that company, and uh, I saw that company grow from that 40 people to roughly 400 people in, in size, and was really really lucky. I, I got to work as become a number two guy of the, of the company working for me. For the CEO and, and you know, obviously made a ton and ton, tons of mistakes and and, uh, and and learned a lot I hope. And and then left early two thousand ten and then uh, was lucky enough to be one of the uh, co founders of Supercell that we set that up. And you uh, you uh, then made a partial acquisition of the company for fifty one percent to SoftBank for one point five billion. So, what is your current uh, status of the company? So, what is your vision now? Where do you want to take Supercell next? Uh, well, I we, we feel that it's just so so early for for us. Uh, it's uh, obviously extremely early days for the market. I mean, it's just the beginnings of a kind of a new era of how like consumers consume entertainment and, and games. Uh, uh, I mean, very soon we're going to have like five, six billion gamers on on the planet, um, and, and it's growing really quickly. Um, so it's early from a market perspective. It's extremely early from a Supercell perspective. I think we, we just turned like four years old as a company where only have three games out there in the market. Um, our dream is that the games that we have currently, people will still play those in, in 10, 20 years. And you know, fast forward maybe 50 years, hopefully people will remember us as a company who like not only did great games, but was also the best kind of hope for the best game developers and maybe also did something good for the community around around us. So um, still very early. And, and we kind of saw the SoftBank uh, transaction as just one uh, kind of milestone and, and one, one on, on this, which will hopefully be quite a, quite a long journey. Thank you, Kyle. That actually gives us a pretty good route to Blanca, who's the CMO of Romeo. So um, if you could just briefly tell the story of the company, because not all, all of you guys probably here know it. It was founded in 2003, but I'd love to you if... And um, the company is 10 years old, and uh, Angry Birds as a brand is four years old. And that's always an amazing realization when you think about how well known it is globally. Uh, it's, it's unbelievable. Textbooks used to tell you that to build a brand, you need a decade. Here we are after four years with a property that is very, very well known. The game has been downloaded two billion times. Uh, we've done a two series for the game and that's been viewed two billion times as well. And uh, we know it's played everywhere. We were looking at the map the other day trying to find a spot where it's not played. 
and in fact we found a spot in the Vatican. I can't guarantee it was the Pope, but somebody was playing in the Vatican and somebody was playing in North Korea. So we thought, okay, not too bad, not too shabby. So uh, a pretty cool, cool brand. And how it started was 10 years ago, the guys, uh, Nico and Yaska and the guys, they wanted to create the most beautiful games and they you know, in those days, as you were saying, Ilka, the, there was different specs for different phones, and it was a very complex thing to make games for mobile companies. And, you know, 52 games later, almost going bankrupt, um, Angry Birds was launched, and in fact, Kai Head um, mortgaged his parents' house in order to pay um, that year uh, when Angry Birds was launched in, in December of 2009. And, um, the ambition was always to make a fantastic game, and of course it was great because it was the start of the smartphone phenomenon, and Miko and guys decided to focus on the iPhone as one platform, so for once they said we're not going to try to optimize this game for many, we're just going to do a really great game in one. And um, if you think about it, it was a very clever thing to do because um, Angry Birds demonstrated the power of touch and mobility together, and it's a very intimate relationship that you have with your device, you know, and for the first time you were touching it and doing things, so you got like even tactile pleasure from flinging the birds, and it, it, it was a very emotional thing to do. And so, from the very beginning, the guy said, let's build a brand, let's not just build a game. And very early on, they embarked in animation, and if you see our first animation, it's, it's beautiful, it looks really, really, uh, uh, almost clumsy, but it's, it's beautiful and it's been watched over 100 million times. So it's uh, very early on they thought, how can we use the media, uh, other media like animation. And um, the guys were, I think there was some fearlessness in them, which is a very entrepreneurial uh, quality to have. Might also be a bit of a Finnish thing, because it's a small nation and you try, why not? This life it works, by fail, who cares? And so, amazing things like launching a game out of space, like physically out of space. I, it's it's mind-boggling that you would, you know, with a group of a handful of people that the company had at the time, think, ah, let's talk to NASA. And, you know, I was Peter, of course, and NASA guys, and they came up with, yeah, let's launch a, a game out of space. And it was quite funny because then the next question was, how do we get a bird in space to launch the game? And the funny thing is, there was one already because. Uh, one of the astronauts' daughter had given him an angry bird to take to the to space and, uh, and actually was in the Russian station, so there had to be an agreement between the Russians and the Americans to get the, the, the game over. And today, just in Adweek, I read this week, uh, NASA was saying 25% of the traffic into the NASA um, homepage is driven by angry birds. Um, so it's been a, a very fruitful collaboration. That and is, that then, is incredible. Uh, it's a beautiful story. And then, of course, we went to Star Wars, and the, we've been expanding the universe, and we've been expanding what we do. We went into consumer products, we went into animation. We now have the largest animation studio in the Nordics. You even have a movie coming out. And we have a movie coming out, uh, which is made out of, 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 out of Hollywood, actually, and it's, it's being produced by ourselves. It will be distributed by Sony. It's so what, what is your guys' vision for the company? Where do you, where do you see yeah, Angry Birds the, going? The vision is to be an entertainment company. And of course, games are very critical. <coughs> and I think we still need to discuss what kind of company, but I think the digital space is, is one that is really important because we are, we are having games, we are having animation that you can see through the games, we are having a strong social media uh, presence. We don't have about the line advertising or big advertising budgets. It's all very disruptive and very organic. And, uh, and then, of course, we have the movie coming out. And uh, naturally, um, every Disney needs its Mickey, and for us, Angry Birds occupies that space, but naturally, we have to have new brands, too. And uh, that's something that we work on. Every week, we meet, and we look at new pitches, and uh, it's the best day of my week. Every Thursday, we look at stuff. And, so uh, we, can, we can look forward to yeah. hearing more, more of that yeah. from in the future. Yeah. Thank you. So what all these stories have to share is the fact that they, you know, if you listen to the stories, this is not a Silicon Valley story. I actually remember when Steve Blank visited Finland, uh, he said about MySQL that this would have never succeeded in Silicon Valley. Because, you know, it was built for such a long time. And that's, that's kind of the thing you see here. You know, people are very good at what they do. 
And this raises a question of, uh, actually, none of these cases raised venture capital uh, early on. I mean, Kaihek was an angel investor in Rovio. You guys drove, drove the first company with revenue. Same thing, my, my sequel for a very long time. And you guys, those of guys, okay, never raised any venture capital funding. <laughs> so why not? The reason was that because we, we sold on, on the, our uh, work to the, our customers, we could finance on the product development. And we had on, on the couple of times with the Heimer Turun and we discussed together and think about the, should we get and we met a couple of but then we thought about maybe we have a more freedom if we, we don't have anybody outside. So that's and how about you guys with my sequel? You raised the you ended up venture raising venture capital then in two thousand early two thousand. In two thousand so we were five years uh, without doing that. Of course first three years I had to convince everybody that I'm not crazy, you can make money with open source. They're not, we are giving it away, but we are also can force people to pay. And that took, I, took three, four years. And uh, we had, after three years, we started to get investors, but we basically said no, because we didn't know what to do with the money. We, uh, and we were, we thought that we, we were already growing organically, we did grow organically to 15 people, and we didn't see a need to hire more, because we could do what we do. We did, but, but uh, and during the bubble, as uh, was mentioned, that was the best time ever for us. Everybody was ditching closed source uh, databases because it was too expensive, especially they have bought them at outrageous prices during the pre-bubble. So we were in really good time. So the, then we raised uh, uh, only 10% of, of the company, I was saying 10% of the stocks. That's what, what the other is, we didn't want to send it as uh, sell 50% of the company because we wanted to control. So we, we basically waited until we find an investor who was willing to have 10%. So okay, uh, I had one thing to add on, on the story. Of course, if we think, uh, because the Hanno and myself we are thinking about this, uh, that was happening 15 or 18 years ago. And on that time, there wasn't maybe nobody in Finland who really understood how, what, this, what this means to invest in software. And that's, if you don't find a person, if you get just the money, but nothing else, it's uh, fine. Yeah. yeah, maybe like from my perspective, so to be honest, I mean, at Sumer, we definitely did ra try to raise raise money, but uh, but we had like uh, like early on, like, uh, like public funding did not actually just before the bubble burst. There was actually one, one VC, one unnamed VC who was crazy enough to, I think they were going to give us like a, as like two, three million euros or something. And thank God, they, they, I think they were busted, so uh, we didn't raise that. Because I'm, I'm pretty sure that had they raised that money, they would have like spent it all and then bankrupt and all that stuff. So we actually, we had to learn the business in a very, very hard way at the time. Then at this time, Chocolate, uh, we raised during my time, I think 55 million dollars. And, uh, and Supercell has been extremely venture funded from very early on. So. Uh, so we, we founders, we, we invested uh, some of our own savings, or a very big part of our savings to a company. When we were lucky enough to get a, a, a product development loan from TechS early on, and you know, with that combined, we got the company started. But then only, I think, after three months after the foundation, we raised our first seed round, I think 750,000 euros. And again, we kind of complemented that with the support from TechS, which we are extremely, extremely grateful for. And then, uh, Eight months from that moment, we raised eight million euros from Maxwell Partners, and and our ideology was and strategy was really simple. But we always wanted to kind of we can thought that our success is it's about it's going to be about two things. One, we need to get the best people and just create the best environment for those people. And two, those best people, I mean, they have to have enough time because games is obviously a very heat driven business and. Uh, it's, it's extremely hard to forecast and you actually you basically have to get lucky and you have to do like uh, enough releases and then you just hope that, that you know one of those will succeed it's actually quite close to i think investing from that perspective so you have to create their portfolio and you never know like which product or game in our case will will succeed so we we call that let's always try to raise more e even more money than we could ever imagine and i think that that's that's been sort of helpful for us okay. I would say that one of the hardest decisions when being an entrepreneur, in 99, during the bubble, we got one VC who said that they want to, want to buy MySQL, they're prepared to pay, we pay you $50 million now. And we said no. And uh, 
the reason was just because we were not ready and we didn't know that this, this was your, we didn't understand it was a bubble, we didn't understand that a big part of this money would be stocks and we didn't believe in stock. But it still was hard time to say. Mm. But that's, I mean, looking at the, so the environment at the time when all of you, you know, guys were starting up the companies, uh, that time was a lot different. And actually, Blanca, so you're originally from Mexico, is that correct? So you've seen from Nokia and through Fatsa, you've kind of seen the Finnish climate. So how do you, like, do you think there's something changed? Finland is an amazing country. I first came here in 91, and uh, it was a heavy recession. Uh, it was before Finland joined the EU. And uh, there was a big sentiment of who are we? Uh, a small group of Somalians had arrived and Finns were questioning, do we want to be European and uh, will we lose our identity? There was a lot of fear and I would get in the tram and people would look at me and I was like some sort of curiosity. Uh, because at the time there were less than 30,000 foreigners and most of them were European. Um, Finland has grown enormously since then. Um, joining the EU um, helped a lot. Uh, Kids went out with Erasmus program, kids came in, uh, kids started to travel places, and uh, the culture has changed enormously. So I was just sharing with Nikki that um, I'm, a, I'm a super fan of Finland, and there's something incredible going on here. Um, there's, uh, I think in the world as a whole, we're seeing a mixture of a selfie society and a collaborative society, and this collaborative society is actually very deeply ingrained in what we're doing. So we have restaurant days and cleaning up days and we have startup sauna and we have games that involve people working together to build stuff. Um, and a lot of this is being born out of here at the moment. And so last November when I went to Slush, um, it was full of action, full of lights, lots of languages. And I bumped into a friend and I, I, I said to him, hey auntie, how are you? And he goes, oh, this is so unfinished. And then he corrected himself and he said, no, Blanca, this is the new Finland. And I agree. There's something really special. I'm a Finn and a Mexican and I'm dead proud of what's going on here. Okay. Thank you, everybody.